I just want to tell you that we actually are going to go straight into our next panel. Um, thank you again, uh, Robert Smith. Thank you, Alan. Uh, this panel is actually moderated by Dr. Julianne Malveaux, President Emerita of Bennett College for Women. Now, I've got to tell you, Dr. Malveaux, I have been a long-standing admirer of her when I first got to Washington, D.C. She, she was somebody who talked to me about you know, the work that she does. And, and of course, we saw her on television. She's written for USA Today. She's written for Black Issues in Higher Education, The Progressive. She really is a thought leader on the issues of race, culture, class, gender. Uh, and so it's my distinct honor and pleasure to welcome her as the, the moderator for this August panel. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Come on, wake up, y'all. <laughs> I know you could not sleep after you listened to that millionaire brother talk about all his money. <laughs> so again, good afternoon, everyone. I first of all want to thank Maya for her work in putting this together. It's a long overdue opportunity for us to talk about the wealth gap. We spend too much time talking about the income gap. And in terms of this particular panel, to talk about the tax code. Because I don't think we think often enough about the ways we transfer dollars with taxes. I will tell you a funny story that will date me clearly. I worked in the Carter White House, uh, so that dates me clearly. Um, we don't have to say any more about that. But in any case, I was tasked with looking at a piece of legislation around Social Security. I worked at the Council of Economic Advisors. So I was tasked with looking at a piece of legislation to make sure that the legislation um, did what we say it wanted to do. Now, I'm a city person, so anything that has to do with agriculture leaves me. Why am I talking about agriculture in the same context as Social Security? Because they had an amendment in the Social Security bill that restricted the exportation of rutile to one Texas company. I don't even know what rutile is. Well, someone explained to me it was a hemp. Of course, this was the 70s, so I thought they meant marijuana. Um, <laughs> but it's a, it's, a, it's a hemp that... Um, Apparently, there's a lot of use for overseas. But someone had created a law, a, no, created a monopoly by allowing only one company to export this rutile. And in the conversation, of course, because I was green behind the ears, I don't think I'd actually gotten my doctorate yet. Not that that gives you automatic intelligence or anything. But um, I tried to, I talked to my boss and I said, I don't understand this, why I did that? They said, well, they were very close to a senator. So this piece of, the, and you see the amendments. If you look at legislation, you'll see the amendments, which are gifts to people. When someone is restricted to who can export or who can import, it's a present. They might as well wrap it up, put it with a nice balloon on top of it. But this happens more often than we know. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, when the least and the left out advocate for something, something is wrong with us. People talk about people with their hands out. But if you go through carefully and look at hands out, looking carefully at our tax code and at our budgets, you will find that the least and the left out don't have their hands out at all. The Securities and Exchange Commission, the regulation of it is a gift from us to the people who are investing because their basic lives are being regulated out of tax dollars, which means that someone's not ripping everybody off, just us. Um, speaking of banks, but I'm not, I'm not going to go there. What I wa really wanted us to do is to think a little bit about the way that, ta that transfers work. When we look at this whole issue of tax code, I know all of my colleagues here will talk about the earned income tax credit in one way or another, uh, because that is one of the few things that actually says, here is something for you people at the bottom. That's one of the few things. At the other, on the other hand, if you haven't read this book, I would highly recommend a book called When Affirmative Action Was White written by a man, yep, it's a, it's a great book, written by a man named Ira Katz Nelson. And why the book is relevant in this context is because millions if not billions of tax dollars were spent in the post-World War II period transforming former soldiers who were working class into middle class people. They got free education, they got fair housing loans, subsidized loans, the book is about 250 pages long and I think every page you learn something else that was a freebie. But they were not, black men in Mississippi could not get the free education because they had to go through their board, their state board, who would say to someone who wanted to get a BA, oh no, that's okay, why don't you go get a, a barber's license? We'll pay for that. So you ended up in, in the state of Mississippi with fewer than a thousand men, 
black men, that is, and almost 10,000 white men, but fewer than 1,000 black men who have the opportunity to take advantage of this. Again, these are tax subsidies, that literally from the pot from everybody into the small group of people. So again, I don't want to belabor the point. I'm just the moderator. Uh, but I did want to make the point to kind of help folks think a little bit, we, even as you talk about coding that is explicit, we also want to think about the implicit ways that the wealth gap is widened when people make public policy that is either unconscious or very conscious about leaving people out. And so again, as I said, I'm happy to uh, be here with this distinguished group of colleagues who basically have been looking at tax fairness. And it's an important thing to look at, especially right now. The Republicans, and I was told I can't come in here and say anything partisan, so I just didn't. Um, okay. So, I, said, you, I know the young man who called me up and said, you can't say anything partisan. I said, did they ask me to come? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but whoever's marking up the budget right now, whoever they might be, uh, who happens to have the majority in both houses, but that would not be partisan comment either, um, essentially are talking about increasing defense spending, but cutting by $14 billion pre-K education, medical research, and job training. Pre-K education, medical research, and job training. Now, if anybody has paid the slightest amount of attention to Baltimore, one might understand that the uprising there uh, it's just very much like the Tea Party in the 18th century, just for the record. Destruction of property does not make you a thug. If it's uh, in certain contexts, it makes you a patriot. But... <laughs> but what we know about Baltimore is we know. We know that jobs would make a difference. And at the same time, we hear people talking about cutting job training. Jobs Corps, which is a proven successful program. 75% of the kids who went to Job Corps in 2012 last year, the data was available, 75% either went to the workforce, 60%, or went into two or four year college situations, 15%. So while we're talking about tax fairness, we see that the other way that you basically increase the wealth gap, broaden the wealth gap, is when you decide that programs that benefit some that would help them close the gap get cut and disappear. When you cut food stamps, what are you saying? Somebody's gonna be more hungry. You cut pre-K, and when you allow folks to privatize the, the goodies. So I'm going to stop. Forgive me, but I do get wound up about some of these issues. And it's a good thing that we have these experts who are not going to get as wound up as I am, but are going to give you a lot more content um, than I do. We're going to start on this end. Each of them is going to have 10 minutes, and I'm going to introduce them all together so that they have uninterrupted time. But um, I will be... We have a less time than we thought we we're going to have, so each of you does have 10 minutes, and we're going to hope that we have a little bit of time for questions. I will pass a little piece of paper down for you if you go too far over 10. Um, and um, I'm sure someone on Maya's team will do something to me if y'all go too far over. <laughs> oh, okay, there we are. Thank you. And so courteous, didn't even flash that thing at me. I love it. <laughs> Okay, so the first person we're going to hear from is Jeremy Greer. He is the Vice President of Policy and Research Corporation for Enterprise Development. He's done work on, and I know everybody has a package, and so I don't believe in reading to literate people, um, and I'm assuming everyone in here is literate, and if you're not, see somebody on your way out. But, uh, <laughs> but in any case, basically looking at expanding opportunities for low-income people and for their communities, and he's had a number of um, positions in that area, and I'm happy to, when I read about him to know that he'd been working a little bit in my neighborhood in Shaw, uh, 14th and Q, so in Shaw and um, working with small businesses and business development. So we're going to look forward to hearing from him. Frank Clementi, if I don't know you, Frank, I must. 88 Jackson campaign? Yeah, me too. Um, we were all Jackson. Most of us were Jackson babies. Anyway, um, not in the literal sense. Uh, <laughs> Frank is executive director and one of the founders of Americans for Tax Fairness. And this is an organization of about 425 national, state, and local organizations. And of course, Frank did tax policy and other work for Reverend Jackson's 88 campaign, the Keep Hope Alive campaign. And we still keep hope alive. This sister I've been looking forward to hearing from, having read some of her work, uh, Professor, Dr. Provost Dorothy Brown at Emory University. 
She hails from Georgetown, and uh, we won't hold that against her, and New York University, has been teaching law for a very long time, uh, not such a long time, and has crowded a lot of stuff into her career, including her casebook, Critical Race Theory, Cases, Materials, and Problems. Really important book for these times, and Dorothy, we're so happy that you're here. And then finally, and I'm not, I promise not to mess up your name, Ida Rademacher, is that correct? Close. Okay, <laughs> never want to be certain when I'm not. <laughs> but she is the executive director of the Initiative on Financial Security at the Aspen Institute. She led the uh, Workforce Strategies Initiative at Aspen uh, before that, and she has worked on public policy and tax issues, financial security, and consumer finance, testifies before Congress. You know the drill. This is a group of wonderful policy wonks, wonderful policy wonks, and I'm going to sit down, take my seat, and have Jeremy start. <laughs>